Thank you, Dennis. It's great to be with you all here today. It's a, it's a blessing to be in the, the house of the Lord, and uh, it's great to be with a group of people that look as wonderful as you all do. It's, it's amazing. I'm looking directly at my wife when I say that, because I love my wife, but you all look great, too. Uh, it's, it's neat to be here. Uh, it's an honor, actually, to be here in this pulpit, uh, standing on this stage where, where Tim Neal stood for so long. And, uh, just an honor to be, to be here. Uh, I do want to let you give you a little insight, though, into the selection process. I don't know if you knew that, that when Dave left and was going on vacation, um, he was looking for the right person to come and, and actually give this specific sermon during our, our missions week. And as he did that, he looked at different places, and he tried to think about what the criteria were in his mind for a person to come here uh, and, and preach this sermon, this specific sermon. And so the first thing he thought was, he thought, you know what, I need somebody who is incredibly eloquent, who can enunciate, and who can dictate, and who can carve the written word in a way that folks would just be completely fascinated and blown away. He said, I need somebody that can bring the word in a way that people will look at him and think, my goodness, he must have been some type of college professor with the intelligence that he would display on stage. And so, that guy wasn't available. And then he said, I want to get somebody who's, who's a really charismatic kind of guy. Really super duper charismatic. Uh, he smiles and the entire audience swoons. And that guy wasn't available either. And, and then and so on and so on and so on. And he tried to find the right guy. And then finally, he got to the point where he just said, you know what, I just want to find somebody that's good looking. I'm just going to find somebody that's really handsome. <laughs> And that's it. And I'll just throw him up there, and then people can stare at him for a while, and, and that'll be good. And he just gave up, and he said, I'll just take that guy. Just give me the good-looking guy. And the good-looking guy wasn't available either. Um, I'm the only guy. <laughs> you can find so. uh, It wasn't anybody like that, actually. It was just me. Um, but I'm happy to be here, and I guarantee you that I will give you what the Lord's given me. I, I, just, I don't have anything else to give. I'm going to try to do my best not to get in the way and to give you all the information that, that I have. Um, tomorrow is what? Tomorrow is November 11th, and it's Veterans Day. Veterans Day, which is a great day. It's also uh, the birthday of, uh, I think, Pastor Neal, is that your birthday? That's it. Yeah, Pat, that's right. Past, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That's good. But tomorrow is Veterans Day, and uh, it's an interesting day for me because I think back to the time that I was in the Navy. I enjoyed that time. I was very fortunate I was able to serve seven years in the Navy, and I had a, uh, an executive officer on one of my submarines uh, who was just a guy that nobody liked. I was in the submarine service for seven years, loved it, loved it. And I had an executive officer who's the second in command, so if you think about the church, it's kind of like Dave is in charge big time, and I'm way down here, and that's me. Well, the XO was way up here. He was the guy who was second in command on the submarine, and just nobody liked the guy. He was one of those guys that had absolutely no personality. But he always had sayings. He had things that he loved to tell us. He would just try to make us kind of think through some things. And I just hated the sayings because they made us think too hard. One of his sayings was a saying that you've probably all heard before. And it's a pretty interesting saying. His saying was, and if you know it, finish it with me. His saying was, stop cursing the darkness, turn on the lights. Stop cursing the darkness, turn on the lights. Now, that's a very basic saying, isn't it? And what it implies is this. One, that it was dark, right? You weren't doing something you should have been doing. Two, a way existed to make it light. Does that make sense to you, right? It was dark. There's a way to make it better. There's a way that you can make it light. And then three, that you just chose not to do anything about it. You just chose to stay in the dark. Stop cursing the darkness. Turn on the lights. Now, I know that none of you here are, could be considered guilty of ever cursing the darkness. I know that none of us have ever at any given time in our workplace, any of us have ever in our workplace, have actually met by the water cooler with a friend of ours and said, my goodness, I can't believe what the boss did. I know that none of us in the church office, Diane, I'm looking at you, none of us in the church office have looked up and said, I can't believe that Dave did what he did. That's just horrible. My wife would never do that. She's a wonderful woman. None of us have ever cursed that darkness when we've had a chance to go ahead and turn on the lights and do something a little different. 
All we had to do was change the situation. And that saying stuck with me for a long, long, long time. As a matter of fact, that, that saying stuck with me all the way up to now because I thought about it as I considered this sermon. I thought about what, what I was going to, to try to preach upon. And, and as I thought about stop cursing the darkness, turn on the lights, I thought about where we are in the United States of America and in this world right now. And, and folks, I, I've got news, and it's not going to be a surprise to any of you. It's dark out there. It's pretty dark. Um, just a couple of statistics. Over 50 million unborn children since 1973 have been murdered in the United States of America. 50 million human beings murdered in the United States of America. 20 to 30 million people in this world. Now think this through, folks. I'm a descendant of that. I'm, I'm black. I'm a descendant of slaves. 20 to 30 million people in this world are in slavery, in bondage, in sexual slavery. 20 to 30 million. Adolf Hitler himself killed 11 million Jews in concentration camps and was responsible for the death of about 40 to 50 million more people. Joseph Stalin killed 20 to 60 million people are the estimates. Now I said that right here, there's six zero million people Joseph Stalin could be responsible for killing. And the majority of those were his own people. Pol Pot in Cambodia, the estimates are as high as two million people killed out of a population of nine million people. Two million out of nine. There's a man named Joseph Coney. Have you heard about this man? Joseph Coney in Africa right now. What he's doing is he's taking 9, 10, 11-year-old boys and he's bringing them into his army. You know what he calls his army? The Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA. Over 40,000 young boys have just disappeared. Poof, gone. There's a man named Bashir al-Assad in Syria. You may have heard about him. He's a man who used nerve gas on his own people. Bashir al-Assad is responsible for about 100,000 deaths in Syria, the majority of those his own people. And it gets worse. When you come back to the United States, people are dying left and right, certainly, but folks, this is a number that really blows my mind. There are 22 million people in the United States of America, 22 million people or so, that are on illicit drugs, and the reason why is because they don't like living day to day. They don't have any hope. 22 million people, 12% of the population. And then finally it comes to this. This is something I heard this, this Monday on 11 Alive News, and it just blew my mind. Folks, it's dark out there. 152 children. 152 children died in 2012. And they just didn't die under normal circumstances. They died under the care of of the Department of Family and Children's Services. These families were being monitored by DFACS, and the kids died anyway. Over 50 have died this year. The majority of them, and hear this please, the majority of them under the care of one or both parents. It's dark. And it's sad. So here's the question, what do we do? What do you do when it's that dark? How do you fix it? Uh, well, if you think about it, it really goes to the source, and that's how you fix it. Think about what some of the sources are. Let's talk about the United Nations, that organization that is based in New York City. The United Nations would probably talk about the problem a good bit, and then after they talked about it, they would talk some more, and then they would talk some more, and then they would schedule a meeting, and during that meeting, they would talk some more. And effectively, that's about all they would do. How about the United States of America when confronted with this type of darkness? What would the United States of America do? Well, first we'd talk because we're good at that. But we're better than that. We, we might actually send something. We might send some money. And folks, if it gets bad enough, we do send people. But what kind of people do we typically send? The same people we're going to celebrate tomorrow. Veterans. We send military people. That may not solve the problem. 
What can we do as individuals? Now, Ann and I are, are very uh, close with a few organizations. One of them is called Compassion uh, International. Has anybody ever heard of Compassion? The other is called World Vision. We love the World Vision. Everybody heard of those? Um, Holtz International is a, an organization that deals with kids who are waiting to be adopted. We can provide for them. So as individuals, what we do is we, we sometimes seek out those organizations that will help those kids pull them out of that darkness, give them a meal, give them some water, do something to help them. That just puts a dent in it. Now here's where the good news is. What do we do as the corporate church and then specifically as Cornerstone Baptist Church? And that's where it gets fun because we can actually make a difference, folks. There's darkness out there. There's darkness in the world. And this church can make a difference and this church does make a difference. And the way we do it is by sending the only thing that is lasting. The dollars fade away, right? The food will get consumed. But we send the only thing that really matters. We send light to those areas. We send light to those areas in the form uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that we do that. It's exciting and it's thrilling. As a matter of fact, our mission's focus is, and I want you all to say this with me, please. Let's say it all together. Our mission's focus is go light our world. So we're sending light to these areas that need it. And it's fabulous to be a part of that. Now, what is light specifically? Because some people struggle with this. I know I did when I started thinking about this message. I thought, how am I going to define light? And then I came to the definition that made more sense to me than anything else I've ever written about what light really means. This is good. Merriam-Webster, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Anybody remember that? We all Google things now, don't we? I Googled so much stuff for this sermon, it's incredible. I had to go back and look for references later on. But, but this is actually from a book. Anybody remember a book? For young people, it's from young people here. If you don't remember what a book is, look down in the pew in front of you, right in the back of the seat that's in front of you. There's a book there, it's called the Bible. But it's a book, and it's bound and all that. I'm, I'm teaching from an iPad, so. But it's from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and it says this. Light is generally, primarily what light is, is the form of energy that makes it possible to see things. Now think about that. The form of energy that makes it possible to see things. And I love that when we think about it in the context of what we do with missions. When we say go light our world, what are we asking people to do? We're asking them to go ahead and go to the other side of the world. And when they go to the other side of the world, what do they do? They go there and they serve as a point of light. And what does that light do? It helps them see things. What does it help the people around them see? Jesus. It's so appropriate. It's so appropriate that when we say light is a form of energy that makes it possible to see things, that, that we talk about us as believers. Because, folks, in reality... Shouldn't people see Jesus in us? Shouldn't what we have be enough for folks to see Christ? Now, we'll go ahead and get technical here for just a second, just a second. <laughs> and I want to make sure we get this. So we have light within us. We've said that, right? We send light when we send missionaries. Where does that light come from? That light comes from God. How do I know this? Because I can go to 2 Corinthians, and it says... In 2 Corinthians, you won't see the verse there, I'll just read it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. When did he say, let light shine out of darkness? Way back in Genesis 1. At the beginning, he said, let light shine out of darkness. Made light shine in our hearts. He made it shine right here, folks. So that light shines within us. When does it shine? When we become a believer. That light shines within our hearts. To give us the light of what? The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So folks, this light that we're talking about, when we say go light our world, when we talk about light in a greater sense, what's happening is God's light is shining down into us, into our hearts. Now I have a question for you, and this is a rhetorical question, so please don't answer. But when that light shines within us, is it meant to stay within us? In other words, does light just shine on our hearts and then it just hangs out there? Well, no. Because effectively, and this is how I want you to think in this context as we talk about it just for the next few minutes, I want you to consider what your heart really is. And in effect, your heart is really a mirror. What's going on here is the light, the light of God is shining down through you and we want it to reflect off of that. We want it to reflect. 
Can you see this? It's a mental thing. Think about it. God's light shines on us, down through us. Our heart's a mirror. It's simply going to reflect what God gives us if the mirror's clean and if the mirror's healthy. So what we want to do is we want that light to shine through us. We get it from God. All we are is mirrors. We're reflectors. So when we send missionaries throughout the world, we're sending light. And this is cool, folks, because what we do is we see that it's dark, as my old XO said. We know it's dark. We stop cursing the darkness. We know there's a way to fix it. And then we turn on the lights. We flip the switch, which is awesome. And you're to be applauded for that. It's wonderful that we do that here. And it's powerful that we do that here. And it's exciting that we do that here. But but comes the next question. Well, is that enough? Is that enough? It's exciting that we send missionaries to other countries. It's wonderful that we do it. But what, what are we doing? Are we really doing what we should be doing? Are we doing all of those things that we ought to be? And I know that you all want to do what you're supposed to do. So here's the question, and it's a, a neat question. What, what does God want me to do? What is God thinking about me as an individual? What's he thinking about Mike, and what's he thinking about you? Well, we're doing good things because we're supporting missionaries. So when we send that light, what we're doing is we're providing a plane ticket, we're providing money so they can do their work, we're providing all kinds of stuff so they can do the work that they need to do. And it's phenomenal that we do that. It's exciting. And the way I like to think about that is, what we are is, for those of you who likes NASCAR out here, anybody like NASCAR? I like NASCAR a lot. Nobody likes NASCAR except Anthony. That's not good. Not Johnny likes NASCAR, too. I love NASCAR, because NASCAR has a driver, right, who's typically a hotshot guy. You know, he's good-looking and, you know, typically a smart guy, and he talks really well, and all the ladies swoon. And he's the guy that drives the car around in circles for hours. And does a good job of it, too. He typically does a pretty good job. But can a guy win a, used to be called Winston Cup, but now it's called Sprint Cup, championship, can he win that by himself? No, who's he have behind him? The pit crew, right? The pit crew. Now, he's got the guy who runs everything, obviously. He's got his, got his crew chief. But the pit crew, they're the folks that support him. They're the people that make it all work. How about um, the folks who, like, go to the moon? It's a great example for you folks who are about my age. We, send people, we used to send people to the moon, and it was great to do that. We'd send folks, and typically three of them could go, and only two of them could go to the moon. But who were the folks who sat back in Houston? They were the support staff. So mentally, the way I picture this with what we do with missionaries is what we do is we send them off, right? But we're the support team back here, and I've actually had a couple of missionaries say that to me when I've talked to them about what we do. We're the support staff. We're the guys who are back and on, you know, back in, uh, out of the light. They get all the glory, quote, unquote. But we're back here doing a job that's extremely necessary, and there's nothing wrong with being in the support staff. There's nothing wrong with being on the pit crew. Nothing wrong with doing that. The way I like to think of the entire problem when I think about it is I'm a football guy, and I love football. Does anybody love football around here? I know a couple of you do. Doug Simpson throws his hand up in a hurry. Yes, I love football, Mike. I love football. Well, in a football game, folks, there's, there's the team that's out there, right? You know, the teams that are fighting each other. There's an offense and a defense out there. They're going at it. Really good athletes, really good guys. As a matter of fact, you'll see them on television in the sports page. You hear a lot about those folks who are out there fighting. Well, what you don't know is that those guys have to practice. And when they practice, they have to practice against a team who can simulate the other team that they're facing. And for those of you that have played sports before, you know that team is typically called the scout team or a practice squad. What the scout team does is they mimic the other offense or defense or whatever the case may be. So your team can get really good and learn what that team's doing. And as they mimic, what they do is they help the varsity, the first team, they help those guys get better. I like to think of it as the fact that we're in there fighting with those guys, but then they go out and fight the battle on the field on Saturday or Sunday. And for this case, let's talk about Sunday. So what happens is the scout team, which is us, we're getting those folks ready, supporting them, helping them do the things they need to do by providing all that they need so they can go out and fight in the arena. They can go ahead and get on the football field and they can go at it and win for Jesus. I love thinking about it that way. 
It makes sense to me when I think about it that way because I've been on the scout team before. I know what that's like. But folks, I'm here to tell you something, and this is important. This is the entire point of the entire sermon. God doesn't have a scout team. I'll say that again. God doesn't have a scout team. God only has first teamers. He's only got a varsity. And if Jesus has come to live in your heart, if he resides there, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then folks, you're on the first team. Even if you're helping to send missionaries across and around the world, you're on the first team. How do I know this? Well, there are two ways. One is, I want to show you a little example here. Let's assume that where I am is the United States of America, and specifically the point of tape that I'm on is Gwinnett County. And let's assume that back there where Dennis is sitting is Panama. Stan Sherwood's going to come next week. He's going to Panama. Dennis is in Panama. So what we do from Cornerstone Baptist Church is we send light. Can you all see the light? And it's great. With this light, I can see my hand. I can see my wedding ring. I can see my watch. I don't see these things as well as I used to, but I can see them. It's illuminating me. It's helping me see. So what happens is we do this great thing, folks. This is wonderful what we do. It costs a lot of money to get from there to here. So what we do is we take this light, Stan Sherwood and his family. We take these guys and we send them to Panama. Isn't that a great thing? I'm excited by that because it's great that we have the opportunity to send folks to Panama or China or Australia or wherever the case may be. We can send these people and it's wonderful. And if you look back at Dennis, you can see that Dennis is illuminated. Dennis, go ahead and show that. Dennis has got a light. The light of Christ is back there. It's shining on Dennis. He's a good man. Here's my problem. And here's why we're on the first team. One of the reasons, anyway. Dennis is lit up back there. We sent something to him. We sent light. But how about Anthony? Anthony Dixon's sitting right there, and he's in the darkness. Anthony's right around the corner. How about across the street? How about down the block? What happens to those guys who are not in the areas where the missionaries are going? How do we reach them? We well, reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how? How do we reach them? We reach them through us. And why? Because there is no scout team. <laughs> We're on the varsity, and the people that reach those people are us. They're you and I. God does not have a scout team. Here are three reasons why God doesn't have a scout team. First reason, the first reason, the owner of the team has already drafted you. The owner of the team has already drafted you. The owner is God. He has everything. He controls it all, and he drafted you when you became a believer and accepted Christ. So what happens is you become part of that team. He drafted you for a purpose. He got you on the team. If you think about it in the context of football, what happens is you walk in there a poor person and then you walk out rich. I'll say that again. You walk in poor, but you walk out rich. It's great when you leave the draft because at that point what happens is you have riches in Christ Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing. He drafted you to be on the first team. And it's interesting because we have inherent value because of that. Now, I want you to go ahead and go to some scripture here. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is where we'll be. We'll start in verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. God drafted us when we became a believer in Jesus Christ. He uses us every single day. And we have inherent value because the Lord has drafted us. Let's go ahead and start in verse 14. And I'll read this to you. You are, in verse 14 it says... This is Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. What's happening is Jesus is talking here. It's early in his ministry, by the way. He has just laid down some really amazing stuff. He just talked about the Beatitudes. You all are familiar with those. He just told believers that they're salt for the earth. They're preservative. They make it palatable. palatable excuse me. And here he says, you are, and I don't even want to go to the next two words. I just want to go to you are. Jesus looked at those guys and he said, you are. You are 
And it's important because what he does is he defines them in that point. If I look at my wife and I point at her and I say, you are wonderful, I've defined her as being wonderful. If I look at Anthony and I say, Anthony, you're handsome, then what I've done is I've defined him as being handsome. That's in my own mind. In the mind of the Lord, what he's doing here is he is defining them with who they are. He's giving them definition. He says, you are. The creator of the universe says, you are. And it reminds me when he said, in John, he's got seven times when he said this, he said, I am. There are seven great I am statements in John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Jesus defined himself in those terms. And when he said it, people paid attention because he was claiming to be deity at that point. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, when Moses asked at the burning bush, he asked God, what shall, who shall he say came? What is his name and what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. He's claiming to be God, and he was God. But here in this verse, in chapter 14, excuse me, in verse 14, he says, you are. He's telling these people who you are. He's telling us who we are. And then he says something that's unbelievable, that is mind-blowing. He gives us our value because he says, you are the light of the world. Folks, that's good news. <laughs> That's incredibly good news. He says that we are the light of the world, and I love it because it's good news. And one, he says in uh, John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. So what that implies is we're getting our light from him. It's wonderful. It's a good thing. Jesus has given us value, a ton of value as a matter of fact, in the fact that we are the light of the world. Now, let's break off for just a second. I, I struggle with this sometimes because... I, I, I tend to be, and I told my Sunday school class this morning that, that I'm a little insecure at times. Um, and I know none of you people are insecure. You're very, very, very confident in who you are. But I'm insecure. And, and so when I'm insecure, sometimes I wonder about my identity. I go, man, who am I? What am I doing? I'm not what I should be. But folks, we have no reason to be insecure. Because our Heavenly Father, again, King of all kings, Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills, the redeemer of my heart, the redeemer of my soul. He's telling me who I am. And folks, our value should rest in who he tells us we are and not what others tell us. When others tell you you're not smart enough, that's not what God says. God says you're the light of the world. You're not good looking enough. It's too bad. I'm the light of the world. Folks, we have inherent value in that. Our Lord, our Lord told us that, and it's a valuable thing. He gives us our identity. Don't let the world tell you you're anything less than a child of God. Don't let them tell you that you have no value, because you have inherent value that comes within your heavenly Father. When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, we've got to believe that. Know that we are his revelation, his manifestation of himself here on earth. That's who we are when he says, you are the light of the world. He gives us our identity. That's a beautiful thing. The light comes from God. It's simply reflected through us. It's simply reflected through us. So Jesus says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. And then he says something else very interesting. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now get this mental picture, would you please? It's kind of interesting. Imagine that there's a city and it's on a hill. Like Jesus said, city on a hill. It can't be hidden. Why can't it be hidden? Well, you can't pick it up and move it. It would be very difficult. The hill is there and it's very visible. And the city on top of that hill is even more visible. And they did this for a purpose when they built these cities. They did it for two reasons. One was for defense. Imagine this. Imagine that you're trying to come up and you're trying to fight me for some odd reason. Maybe it's because you want me to stop preaching. I'm not sure. But you're coming up and you're trying to fight me. It's much easier for me to defend a high position. Wouldn't you agree? And that's the same thing with the city on a hill. From a defense perspective, it was easy to defend the city on a hill. That's one of the reasons why they built them. But that's not the reason we're talking about here. The second reason is identification. The second reason cities were built on a hill was because of identification. It was easy to figure out where the city was if you could see it because it was on a hill. I have not been to the Holy Land. But from what I understand, there are lots of cities on lots of hills. 
And the reason why, because they were easily defended and easily identified. When God drafts us onto his team, we become that city on a hill. When he drafts us, we're the city on a hill, and that means that we can't hide. We become celebrities. I'll tell you what I mean. When I got saved, I changed radically. My life changed almost 180 degrees. I'll say 175 degrees, not quite 180. But it changed a lot. And when I went to work the next day, I got saved on a Sunday, I went to work on Monday. Folks knew something was different about me. There was something that changed. And I couldn't hold it to myself. There was no way I was going to be incognito as a believer. Because I had this light inside of me and it had to get out. I was different. And folks, that's what happens with us. When we get drafted by the owner, when God drafts us, just like they have on TV when you watch the draft on ESPN, they show those guys, they take pictures of them, they put their hats on, hold up the jerseys. Folks, when we get saved, no longer, no longer can we be incognito. <laughs> the city on a hill can't be hidden. Folks will see you and see that something is different about you. When you get drafted, you become a celebrity. So one, one reason. One reason that we're on the first team is the owner has already drafted us. The second reason, the second reason that we're on the first team is because the owner, God, has already developed a position for us. He's already got a position in mind. He's already got a place for us. He knows where he wants us to go. Let's continue on in Matthew. In verse 15, Jesus said, Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now think about this here. Those lamps they had in the old days had a little handle on them, a little spout on one end, a wick in the middle, and you could put a bowl. Some of your translations will say bowl. You could put a bowl over that and cover it. And what he's saying here is, why would people do that? Why would you do that? It's the equivalent of like walking into your bedroom, turning on the lights, and then going to the kitchen. Why would you do that? Why would you light something and then cover it up? It doesn't make any sense. So God drafted us for a position or a reason. And, and here's the neat thing. For those of you that follow football, you know that quarterbacks are typically drafted out of, out of college, and they're paid enormous amounts of money. And so what happens is they, they pay lots of money to those guys, and they figure, I can't pay them a lot of money to sit. I've got to start them now. I've got to get them in the game now. Because we're paying them way too much money to sit and learn. They've got to start right now. Well, God paid too much for us to let us sit. The price that he paid is an unbelievable price. He paid with the blood of his own son, the life of his own son. So we can't afford to have us sit. He wants to use us right now. We all have a purpose. And when God says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but he tells us what that purpose is, but on a stand, and that's great. So here's the question again. We all are created for a purpose. That purpose is to shine, and we'll find that in just a second. But when he says he takes that lamp and he puts it somewhere, he puts it on a stand, he puts it there for a reason. He places that lamp there for a reason. Now, I know in my own life, there have been times when I've thought, why am I here? Um, I accepted a severance package from work, and I kept thinking, why am I here? Why, what's going on? Why would the Lord let me do this? And I would think about why I was where I was and what I could do to get out of it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been in a position or in a place or in a time when you've looked and you've thought, why am I here? I want to go someplace else so I can do great things for Jesus. I need to go to seminary because that's the only way I'll be able to do good things for Jesus. I want to get out of this backwater, this small town, so I can go off and do great things for Jesus. And what he's saying is, <laughs> one, you can shine right where you are. And two, don't try to run from where I planted you. Folks, sometimes we run around, we try to figure out what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And the bottom line is, we're right where we're supposed to be. But what we do, what we do is this. 
It says in verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Again, your translation says maybe a bowl. What we do is we take a bowl and we cover up the light. We take the bowl and we cover up the light. My bowl is I don't like to talk to people out in public. So what I'll do is I just I say, well, I don't need to go ahead and share the gospel with that person because, you know, they're going to get it someplace else. This is a Bible belt after all. So what's your bowl? Is it your past, maybe? Maybe you think there's no way anybody would listen to me about Jesus because of what I've done in the past. God lets you up. He puts you in a place. He wants you to shine. There's a way that we are taking a bowl and putting it over that light. Maybe your bowl is the fact that you don't think you can speak well. The Holy Spirit will provide the words. Maybe your bowl is you don't like to talk to your neighbors. Take that off. Go talk to them. Maybe your bowl is you think you can't do the things you used to do. Well, do what you can. All he's asking you to do is shine. All he's asking you to do is shine. When you're, right, you know, when you're in the right position, functioning the way you're supposed to, everyone benefits. And it says so in God's word. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket in verse 15. But where they put it, they put it on a stand. Again, it's on a stand. It's where it's supposed to be. The lamp is meant to be on a stand. It's there in the right place. And what happens? It gives light to who? Everybody in the house. All in the house. Everybody gets the benefit of the light. I've known people who have gotten saved and they've gone and they've shared the gospel with their whole family and their whole family's gotten saved. I've known people who have gotten most of their work saved just by going out and witnessing to everybody in that place. I've known people who have completely blown up entire villages for God. And by blown up, I mean shared the gospel and the next thing you know, people are saved left, right, and sideways. As a matter of fact, there's a story that I read in preparation for this sermon where... I heard that there was a, a village that was visited at the end of World War II where the gospel had been shared. It's actually, I'm not sure exactly where the village was, but the rest of the villages that the army would visit, they were in shambles. Nothing really there. People didn't really seem to care about much of anything. But they found a village full of Christians, and it was thriving. And people were happy, and they were excited. They enjoyed life. They had faced a lot of, uh, a lot of disparity and a lot of problems. But the bottom line was they were happy and they were excited about what they were doing and it was clean. They wondered what was going on. And there was a non-believer who was actually with the army contingent. And he said, well, he said, I, I see what a couple of missionaries and a few Bibles can do. Because that's all I had. I had a couple of missionaries with a few Bibles come to them some 40 or 50 years before. And they changed the entire outlook of the village. Folks, nor do people light a lamp on a stand and put it under a basket, but on a stand, excuse me, and it gives light to all in the house. When the Lord puts you there where you're going to shine, and that place he has for you, that purpose that he has for you, you're going to shine. And you're going to shine on those people who are believers and non-believers. It doesn't matter. You're going to shine on them. And you'll make a difference. Now, I'm pretty premillennial in belief, and I think that, and what that really means is I, I think that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation happens. So we're going to be raptured out of here before the great tribulation happens in Revelation. If you don't know what that is, talk to me later. And I believe that when that happens, that literally there's going to be hell on earth because I think the impact that we have as believers is monumental on this planet. And once that influence is gone, it's just going to be a horrible place to be. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. So one, God's drafted us for his team. The owner's drafted us for his team. Two, God's developed a position for us on the team. He's got a position for us. We know where that's supposed to be. And then three, finally, God's designed a play just for you. God's designed a play just for you. And our play is very simple to execute. All we've got to do is shine. In verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine. In the same way, let your light shine. Our light, our purpose. I'm not called to shine for you. You can't shine for me. I've just got to let my light shine. That's it. And shining should be like breathing for three reasons. One, I don't have to make myself shine. I don't have to give myself the power. All I've got to do is let myself shine. There's a quote I like from a woman named Lucy Swindoll. She says, A friend of mine was caught in an elevator during a power failure 
At first there was a momentary panic as all seven strangers talked at once. Then my friend remembered the tiny flashlight he had in his pocket. When he turned it on, the fear dissipated. During the 45 minutes they were stuck together, they told jokes, laughed, and even sang. The Bible says we're all of that flashlight. Just as the flashlight draws power from its batteries, we draw power from Jesus. As light, we dissipate fear, bring relief, and lift spirits. We don't even have to be big to be effective. This is the part I love. We just have to be on. We don't have to be big. We just got to be on. That's it. We just got to shine. Now, there are two things that can keep us from executing the play, from shining. They're both related to our ability to reflect. Remember I said, and I read that verse from 1st, 2nd Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 6, light shines in us, shines back out through it from our hearts. Two things can keep that from happening. One is the proximity to the mirror. The proximity to the source of light. Proximity of the mirror to the source of the light. You all know what I'm talking about here. The further you get away from light, what happens? It gets dimmer, right? It gets dissipated. So if I have a light and I shine it very close in my eye, it's going to be extremely bright. But if I shine it in Doug's eye, back in the sound booth, then what happens is it's not going to be nearly as intense. Folks, more closer to the light, the light has a great deal more power. And so it is with, with our Father. The closer we are to Him, the better we're going to be. As we get distracted by the affairs of this life, we can lose sight of the Lord. We always move away from Him, though, it seems like. He never moves away from us. He doesn't. He said, I want to never leave you nor forsake you. So just like a flashlight is dimmer, the farther away you get that light we get from God, the further away we get from Him, can be dimmer as well. And it's not Him, folks. The source of the light is the same. It's us. It's us walking away from Him. Second, and this is more important, we've got to keep the mirror, right? If we reflect, we have a mirror, we've got to keep the mirror clean. A dirty mirror can really make a difference. Now, imagine this. You have a mirror, and you want to go ahead and cut your hair, and so you want to cut in the back of your hair, so you have your mirror here, and you're cutting. Uh, I don't cut my hair very often, so please bear with me here. If that mirror is dirty, are you going to be able to see very much? As a matter of fact, if the mirror is dirty, if it has spots all over it, you're going to see maybe a misrepresentation of your hairline. You might even make a mistake. The dirtier the mirror is, the further away from the original image its reflection will be. So, folks, what we've got to do is, one, we've got to stay close to the light, but, two, we've got to keep that mirror clean. Before, we said we only reflect the light that God has for us, and we've got to do that. Light's fixed. All we can change is what happens with the mirror. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. You may become blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke. And what we've got to do is live in that sense. We've got to keep the mirror clean. Stay clean as possible because a dirty mirror can't reflect what is shown upon it. The light isn't reflected. It's dissipated. A mess is made of it. So we've got to keep our internal mirrors as possible, as much as possible, clean. We must not block the intensity or the beauty of the light. So again, our proximity and the cleanliness of our heart. Our hearts are cleaned, folks, and we go to Jesus and ask him to do so. Folks, we just have so much responsibility in this game. And when we think about it, all God's asking us to do is shine. In this case, he's saying, we're there, all I'm asking you to do is do what you were designed to do. By the way, the play that was called for us the shining play, it doesn't work on the sideline. So you can't do it on the sideline. You've got to be in the game to play. Does that make sense? If you run the play on the sideline, it has no impact on the game. You've got to be on the field of play, in the field of battle, in order for that play to have any kind of sense at all, for it to make sense. So what God says in his word is, in the same way, let your light shine before others. It's got to be for others. That light has to be visible. So when he says, let your light shine, execute the play on the field of play before others. Why? So that they may see your good works. The Greek word for good here is a word that actually means beautiful or attractive. They'll be attracted to those good works. Have you ever done something for somebody and have asked you, why are you doing this for me? Why do you care about me? Why, why would you do this? 
what's happening is they become attracted to that light that's shining from you. They see that work, the good works. And they know there's something different about you. And then finally, why? Why do all this? Why have any of these things happen? Why shine? Why be in the right position? Knowing that you're drafted. Why be in that position that God has designed for you? Why execute the play that God has for you? And this is the answer to the question. At the end of verse 16, and give that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Oddly enough, this is one of those plays when we execute it, we don't get the glory for it. If it's done right, we don't get it. God gets the glory, and that's the end result. The end result of this play is that God will get all the glory. So when we do it right, he will be glorified. God will be glorified and not us. So folks, we're on the front lines. We're on the first team. But there's good news. One, we've been drafted by the owner. We're in the right place. He's designated a position for us. And then finally, he's designed to play for us. All we've got to do is shine. We've got to see the darkness, and we've got to flip the switch. Turn on the light here in Gwinnett County. So now we've got an opportunity, and I want to make this practical for you. We can change. We can change three things. First, we can change ourselves. We can clean the mirror, make sure it's perfect and prepared for God. What we can do is go and confess our sin to him. Confess sin and ask for forgiveness. We can draw close to our Heavenly Father by praying every day, devouring Scripture every single day. Via a small group, on your own, doesn't really matter. Just getting into God's Word and drawing close to Him will make a world of difference in your lives. Trust me, it's made a world of difference in mine. And then folks, giving every day, giving of ourselves, whether it's time, talents, resources, money, whatever. Giving those things every single day. We can change ourselves. And if we do that, then, folks, we have the ability to change others. We can show them who Jesus is, and that will change their lives forever. Some things really don't sink in, I think, for us as believers. And one of those things that doesn't sink in is we can have an eternal influence on the area around us. We can have an eternal influence on the racetrack. We can have an eternal influence on our neighborhood. It's a powerful, powerful thing to think that through, to know that we can have that type of impact. So we can show them who Jesus is and change their lives forever. How do, we, how do we show them who Jesus is? Well, surely we can witness to them. We can talk to them about Jesus, make them aware of their sin and their need for a Savior, and then lead them on. That's one thing that we can do, and it's great to be able to do that. But we can share the gospel without words. We can mow the neighbor's lawn. We can invite them to church. We can pray for their salvation. We can pray for our neighbors. Do you pray for your neighborhood? Do you pray for your neighborhood? We can take meals to families' homes when they're sick if we hear about it. We can give them financial help if they ask us to. I know, that hurts. But we can. That's why we're giving these resources. We can do that. We can watch kids for single parents that are exhausted. Folks, we can give, 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 give. Uh, one thing that we, we found, Diane and I teach a class called Divorce Care. My wife, Diane, and I teach a class called Divorce Care. And one thing that we talk about in that class, when we talk about healing and trying to heal from the pain and the agony of separation and divorce, one of the most profitable things that you can do as an individual to heal from the pain of separation and divorce is to do for others. Is to do for others. It's a powerful thing when we stop focusing on ourselves and focus on those around us. And then finally, folks, if we do that, we change ourselves, we change our little neighborhoods, we change our streets. Folks, we can change the world by sending missionaries to Panama and China and Australia and England and Brazil. And we can change the world by impacting those around us at the racetrack, at the Chili's where you're going to go for lunch, We can impact the entire planet for eternity 
just by doing what we're called to do, by shining, by flipping the switch, seeing the darkness, going out, flipping the switch, and making a difference in this world. We're on the first team. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you a few questions. There's a play that's designed for you. God drafted you. He put you in the right position. He's got a play that's designed for you that only you can execute. Are you executing that play that God has designed for you? You know, we all want to know in this life what God's specific will is for us, but are you following his general will? Are you doing the things that he called you to do today? Are you letting your light shine by sharing the revelation of Jesus Christ? Sharing his knowledge, the gospel of Jesus, with those around you? I ask that today you take a, take a look inside yourself and think about one person, one person, who could be changed by that. Believer, I'm talking to you. There, everybody can be changed by it. We pray that you would just make that decision today to go out and talk to one person about Jesus, to show your life. There's a position on the team that's been reserved for you. Do you have a bowl in your life that you need to get rid of? Is there some crutch that you're holding on to that's keeping you from shining the way you need to shine? Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get rid of that, and we've got to do the things that we were called to do. We have to do what we were called to do. And if you're confused by everything, if you're here and you're confused by everything I've said today, I ask you, do you know if you've been drafted? Do you know if you're even on the team? Do you know the owner? Do you know Jesus? Folks, if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, all of this is foolishness to you. But if you want to know him, I got better news for you. He wants to know you. All you have to do is surrender your life to him. Folks, if there's some decision that you'd like to make today, if there's something that you need to deal with Jesus about, about how you're performing, about what you're doing on the team, about your ability to shine, and what you wish to do with your ability to do that going forward, please come forward today. The altar's open for you. We'll be here waiting, and he is there waiting as well. Please stand with us now as we sing an invitation song.